Praise the Lord. I said, Praise the Lord. Tonight's Bible study is special. And I pray it will be special in your life in Jesus' name. And the study will not be lost on you. And this day will not be lost on you. You will receive. You will learn. And the word of God will do good in your life in Jesus' name. I want to appeal to those who are coming for the first time. It's Bible study time. And that makes us to go to different parts of the Bible. And the Lord will enrich your life as you go along with us in Jesus' name. And for the old timers who have been coming for a long time, today will be a new day in your life. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this hour. We thank you for this moment. We thank you for your word. And we know that you are going to enrich every life in your word tonight in Jesus' name. You bless your people. You enlighten your people. You will show the meaning of the word as it applies to every individual tonight in Jesus' name. Confirm your word and the truth and your power in every life tonight. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. And the good people of the Lord shout. Amen. God bless you. Can see now we're coming to Mark chapter 9. And tonight we're looking at verses 9 all through to 29. Mark chapter 9. And I'm reading from verse 9. If you had been following with us last week, we studied and we learned on the Lord's transfiguration. He went to the mount and he prayed. And as he prayed, Moses appeared and Elijah appeared. He was transformed and transfigured before them. And as he was transfigured before them, eventually Peter said, Lord, it's good for us to be here. It's good to be in the presence of the Lord. I said, if you will, if you want, if you permit, if you desire, we'll make three tabernacles, one for you and one for Moses and one for Elijah. Actually, he didn't know what was saying because the vision, the revelation took him by surprise. And eventually a voice came from the cloud that overshadowed them. The voice of the Heavenly Father, here is my beloved son, Hear ye him. And now they are coming back from the Mount of Transfiguration. That's what we're looking at today. If you turn with me to Mark chapter 9, verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, he charged them. That is, he charged those disciples, that's uh, James, jo John, and Peter, that they should tell the vision to no man. Uh, that what they had seen till the Son of Man were risen from the dead. We'll continue reading that later, but eventually they came to the other nine disciples, three nine, making twelve, and they had been confronted with a problem. And the problem was that a man brought a demon possessed son. And they couldn't do anything about it. They prayed and they asked and they did everything they knew to do. But there was no answer. And so the man came to Jesus and said, I brought this, my son, before your disciples so that they will help to deliver him and heal him and set him free. But they could not. And Jesus said, bring him to me eventually. And the man, he told the man that um, all things are possible. But that believe for the people that believe in God. Look at verse 23. And this is the very center. And the shining star in the passage we are looking at today. Jesus said unto him. If thou canst believe all things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible to him that believeth. I want you to understand the him there, the man there. He wasn't a believer yet. And Jesus said, if you can turn around away from your unbelief. 
the darkness of unbelief and come to the light of faith. If you can only believe tonight, all things are possible to him who believes. If he could tell the unbeliever that, the man that, who had never met Jesus and who had had failure in his life and a problem in his family. If he could tell that person that is telling you the same thing today, all things are possible as you believe tonight. In your life, all things are possible. In your family, all things are possible. And in your profession, all things are possible. In your Christian life, for you to rise up and walk majestically before the Lord and walk in strength and walk in power and walk in confidence and walk with victory. Victory is possible in your life tonight in Jesus' name. And I want you to hold on to that verse as we go through all the verses we're going through, understanding that in other parts of the Bible we're being told with God all things are possible. And with the Lord Jesus Christ, from everything we've seen, everything we've known, with Christ, all things are possible. And of course, you understand the Spirit of God. With the Holy Ghost, all things are possible. And with every believer, the believer in the world tonight, Lord, I believe you tonight. I said, Lord, I believe you tonight. For the believer in the word, all things are possible. When you come to the Lord Christ, enters into you. That's why he says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in unto him and sup with him. Or the Christ indwelt man, or the spirit filled man, and with the God indwelt man, and with the word inspired man, a man that lives on the word, a man that believes the word, a man that looks unto God the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ dwells fully in him, was such a man tonight, was such a woman tonight, all things are possible. Look at that verse 23 again, chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said unto him, you remember Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if Jesus were to physically appear to you today, this is exactly what he'll be telling you. We know that he said his word will never pass away. Heaven and earth may pass away, will pass away, but his word will never pass away. And he's saying the same thing today because his word has not passed away. Jesus said unto him, and Jesus is saying unto you, if thou canst believe. That what thou, you understand, means you in particular. If you can believe, how many things are possible? All things are possible to him who believes. And as you believe tonight, the Lord will make impossibilities possible in your life in Jesus' name. And you need to understand this. When it says, if thou canst believe, you say, Lord, I don't know whether I can believe or not. You understand, in everything in life, everybody starts at, zero, at the zero level. Think about writing. When we came to this world, we didn't know anything about writing. We started at the zero level. Think about speaking, talking to other people. When we came to this world, we didn't know a single word. We started at zero level. And the work you are doing now, if you are driving now, there was a time you started at zero level. You didn't know how to do anything at all. If you are able to stand and walk and run now, we didn't know that when we came to this world. We started at zero level. Yet, by learning and by practice, we have come to the stage now we can write almost anything, we can say almost anything, we can put words together without even thinking, and we can act and we can do everything we need to do without even thinking about it. The same thing with faith. We might start at zero level, but as we learn, and we're going to learn tonight, as we learn and we practice what we learn, we're not going to remain at the zero level. We're going to have faith. We're going to have great faith. We have to have, we are going to have activity faith. And the faith that will work in every life in Jesus' name. Tonight we're looking at the message, the possibilities of unwavering faith in Christ. Unwavering faith in Christ. 
when we have faith in Christ, it's like you have faith in uh, the taxi man. You enter the taxi and then you relax and you just have a wavering faith in him. You say, this way I'm going. Uh, and he says, yes, I know the place. Even if he doesn't say, I know the place, you assume uh, he knows the place. And then you sit down, you relax. Maybe you're even reading, you have a wavering faith in that stranger. And then you meet uh, somebody else in the community, and uh, he says, uh, This is going to happen, and this is the date. You're right, you know, you just accept it's going to be so. Now, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, tells you that all things are possible tonight in your family and your life. And if we can have faith in ordinary men, in Christ our Savior, in Christ our Lord, in the extraordinary one, in the mighty one, in the knowledgeable one, in the one that has never failed, his name is Jesus. If we could have faith in ordinary people, in the Lord tonight, I have faith. I said in the Lord tonight, I have faith. The possibilities of unwavering faith in Christ. We're going to divide the message to three parts. Number one, the prophecy and the foreknowledge of his suffering. The prophecy and the foreknowledge of his suffering. Very many times Jesus Christ spoke about his suffering, his sacrifice, his betrayal, his death. And then his resurrection. And all that had been prophesied. He spoke about that. He knew about that. And now he tells us once again. The prophecy and the foreknowledge of his suffering. Point number two. Powerlessness. The powerlessness of the faithless among saints. The powerlessness of the faithless among saints. As somebody has become a believer, a child of God, a saint of God. And now he prays. And when he prays, it's not just because you are a child of God, a brother or your sister. It's not just because you are a saint of God and the blood of Jesus has washed you whiter than snow. It is because you are having faith in Christ. When you pray, what makes the prayer to be answered? Faith in Christ. When you fast, what makes the fast to be effective? Faith in Christ. When you demand something from the Lord, what makes that demand to come unto you? Faith in God. That's why he puts everything on faith. And he says, if you can only believe everything you are praying for, everything you are prayed about, everything you have asked the Lord, the Lord will give unto you. But if somebody is praying, there are many people that pray, they pray and pray and pray. They pray and shout. They pray and sweat. They pray and roll on the ground. They pray and do quite a lot of things, sacrificial things, the things that put some pressure and pain on them. It is not the pain in prayer. It's not the shouting in prayer. It's not the activity in prayer. It's not the rhythma roll in prayer. It's not the walking up and down in prayer. There's nothing wrong in walking up and down in prayer. But you see, what makes faith to be, what makes prayer to be answered is your faith in God. If you all do all those things for prayer and you don't have faith, there will be no answer. But tonight, an answer is on the way. The powerlessness of the faithless among the saints. Point number three. The possibilities of faith. In his sufficiency. The possibilities of faith. In his sufficiency. Christ is sufficient for me. I said for me. For me. Christ is sufficient for me. Everything you need. Everything you ask. Everything you seek. Everything you are knocking the door of heaven for, all those things are possible tonight. And you might even begin to think about it now what you are going to have. Spiritual things, emotional things, professional things, physical things, material things. And as you demand of the Lord tonight, I rejoice with you, he will answer your prayer. The possibilities of faith 
in his sufficiency. Let's come back to point number one. Point number one, I'm reading from Mark chapter 9. From verse 9 to verse 13. The prophecy and foreknowledge of his suffering. The prophecy and the foreknowledge of his suffering. We're coming to Mark chapter 9. And I'm reading from verse 9. Mark chapter 9, verse 9. And as they came down from the mountain, that is from the Mount of Transfiguration, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen. He wanted them to see that special vision and revelation of his transfiguration. And he had told them earlier that some of you, not all of you, but some of you, will not taste of death until you see the Son of Man, the Son of God, come in in his glory and his power. And he didn't want at this time for that glory, for that splendor, and for that power, to that majesty, to be, to be revealed to everyone. Because this was the time of his humiliation. And the time of his suffering. And the time of his going to the cross to die. And he didn't want, you know, the whole people to come together and to say, Well, if that glory is there, we want to make him king now. So he said, don't tell any man. Just have this to yourself for your own assurance. So that when you begin to preach the gospel later, you have the assurance. You are not following a cunningly devised fable. So he said, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the Son of Man be risen from the dead. Look at verse 10. And they kept that saying with themselves, questioning one another, one with another, what the rising from the dead should mean. They should have understood because he had told them over and over that the Son of Man will be betrayed. And the Son of Man will be killed, crucified. And on the third day he will rise from the dead. And he just told them, building on what he had told them before. Don't tell anyone until the Son of Man rises from the dead. They were not even thinking about his death. Not to talk about his resurrection. Look at verse 11. And they asked him, saying, Why say the scribes that Elias, Elijah must come first? And then in verse 12, and he answered and told them that Elias, Elijah, verily cometh first and restoreth all things, and how it was reaching of the Son of Man that he must suffer. You see that? The prediction of his suffering, the prophecy of his suffering, the foreknowledge of his suffering. It had been written concerning the Son of Man, concerning Jesus Christ. It had been written that he must suffer many things and be searched at naught. But I say unto you that Elias, Elijah, is indeed calm. And they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. Now the, the understood eventually that was talking about John the Baptist. Let's look at the parallel passage in Matthew chapter 17. Matthew chapter 17, I'm reading from verse 10. Matthew chapter 17, we're looking at verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias, Elijah, must come first? The question is, why did the scribes, the teachers of the law, the priests and the high priests, and the leaders in Israel, why did they say that Elijah must come first? Uh, let's um, go to Malachi. I'm coming back to that, Matthew chapter 17. But we need to answer the question, where did those scribes get the idea? That, that uh, Elijah must come first. That Elijah will come and then after the coming of Elijah, there will be the revelation of the very Son of God. Look at Malachi chapter 4, reading from verse 5. Here is the word of the Almighty God. Here is God the Father talking about the events of what will happen at the, before the second coming of Christ. 
And this event was recorded even before the first coming. And the children of Israel confused the first coming with the second coming. The first coming was for him the misery to suffer. The first coming was for him to die for our sins. The first coming was for him to make the sacrifice that will give everybody the opportunity of salvation. And then after that, there will be the church age. After that, there will be the rapture. After that, there will be the tribulation upon this world. Then after that, there will be the second coming. And the Lord was talking here about in Malachi, about the second coming that is before the second coming of the Lord, that here is what will happen. But there were similarities, some few similarities between the first coming and the second coming. And the people of Israel, even the disciples, they were putting the two things together, the first coming and the second coming. Look at Malachi chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and deadful day day of the Lord. Already from the language you can tell, it's talking about when Christ will come again, the second time. That's what is called the great and dreadful day of the Lord. But the disciples did not understand, and the scribes did not understand, and they were putting the coming of that Elijah uh, to the first coming. If the Messiah comes, obviously Elijah will precede him. Look at uh, verse 6, and it says, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. And uh, that right there, that's why the scribes said that Elijah will come first. And because of their misinterpretation of the Bible and their misunderstanding of when that will take place, that's why they miss the benefit of the first coming of Christ. Let's come back to Matthew now, Matthew chapter 17. And I'm reading from verse 10. Matthew chapter 17, verse 10. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that Elias must come first? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elijah, Elias truly shall come forth and restore all things, shall come forth and restore all things, shall come forth. That's in the future. Not at the first coming now, but in the future, Elias will still come. And he will restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias is come already. What? Elias has come already. There are two prophecies uh, concerning uh, the coming uh, of Elijah. There is one in uh, Isaiah that a forerunner will come and it will make the way, it will prepare the way before the Lord. That refers to uh, John the Baptist, like Elijah, that will come before the first coming of Christ. But the other one we read in Malachi is referring to the Elijah, somebody like Elijah, that will come at the second coming, before the second coming. John the Baptist, like Elijah, coming before his first coming. But another prophet, mighty and great, and able to do all things, will come before the second coming. And so now Jesus is referring to the Elijah that shall come before the first coming. That's why it says in Matthew chapter 17 verse 12, But I say unto you that Elias is come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever the listed likewise shall they also do to the Son of Man, and he will suffer of them. Let's go to Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 15. The angel came and spoke to Zechariah. Zacharias, and he's talking about the first coming of Christ now. And somebody will come. Somebody is going to be born before the first coming of Christ. 
And who is that? John the Baptist. Look at verse 15. And he shall be great, that's John, in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord their God. Look at this. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias. Before the first coming, somebody is coming. That will come before Christ. And he will go before Christ, he will come before Christ in the power and in the spirit of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. That's talking about John the Baptist. But the scribes were confused. They didn't understand. First coming, second coming. And I pray that every confusion will go away from your heart in Jesus' name. And because of that misunderstanding, that's what they did, what they did to John the Baptist. And Jesus was also going to suffer. Remember that we're talking about the prophecy and the foreknowledge of uh, his suffering. Let's come to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 23. Acts chapter 2, we're looking at verse 23. Look at what he said about Christ and about his suffering, about the thing that happened to him. It was not an accident. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. That's the word there, foreknowledge of God. That is Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior. He suffered. It was not an accidental suffering. It was predicted and prophesied. And it says it was by the foreknowledge of God. Ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. Look at Acts chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 25. Acts chapter 4, we're looking at verse 25. Who, by the mouth of thy servant David, has said, Why did the hidden rage of the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For the truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together for to do, listen to this, for to do, in order to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. He said, this was not accidental. It was predicted. It was prophesied by the foreknowledge of God that this will happen. Let, let's uh, understand then, uh, nothing uh, happened to Christ by accident. He did nothing to him uh, by surprise. It was all written concerning him that he will suffer that will make a sacrifice, that will bring salvation to the whole of humanity. It was written concerning him about his betrayal, about his death, about his resurrection. All these things were written and they were fulfilled according to prophecy and God's knowledge in everything to the minutest detail well, that everything happened unto Christ. But then uh, the reason we need to ask the question why? It, we know it was prophesied, and we know it was for the, from the foreknowledge of the Almighty God. Why? Why did he suffer? Why was he betrayed? Why was he crucified? And why did he die? And why was he buried? He came to reverse the fall of man. Everything was lost by Adam's fall. Christ came. And when he came, he came to restore everything we lost in Adam. Everything you lost in Adam, restoration will come. Because Christ has come for the first time. And he, he sacrificed and he paid the full price. 
And because he paid the full price, that's why in your life, whatever the devil, whatever evil spirits, and whatever the world has done, and they are, and they are saying they have the power to do that, because of the fall of Adam, reversal is going to come today. And then he came to save. That's why he came for the first time. His first coming was to save. That's why it was prophesied that he will come. He will come. And when he comes, he'll make an end of sin. If you are not saved yet, you are saved tonight. He will cleanse your life. He will forgive you. He says, as you come. He says, let's raise it together. Don't your sins be as college? They'll, make, they'll be made as white as snow. And though they be like crimson, they'll be as white as wool. He came to sanctify. He came so that he can redeem all Israel from all their sins. He came to make us holy. That's what he came the first time. When he comes the second time, he's coming to rule. He's coming to reign. But the, because he came the first time, that's why well, now we can be saved. Now we can be sanctified. And he came to heal. If you are sick tonight, healing has come. Because of the first coming, he came that first time and he bore all our shame. And he bore all our stripes and all the sicknesses that should have been upon us. He bore everything. I am healed. And you remain well in Jesus' name. And he came to deliver. He came to deliver from the power of the devil. From the power of evil spirits. He came to deliver from every known affliction. Every known affliction. That's why he came the first time. And do not confuse the first coming with the second coming. He came to suffer the first time. He's coming to reign the next time he comes. He, ca he came to empower us. Somebody help me shout power. power. He put power in us. Courage in us. Victory in us. Confidence in us. All the weakness and all the trembling and all the lack of backbone, he'll take everything away in Jesus' name. And he came to make us feet for heaven. He came to make us feet for heaven. Heaven is a prepared place and the Lord will prepare you for that place in Jesus' name. I come to Psalm 22. We're talking about the prophecy of his suffering. And we're talking about the foreknowledge of his suffering. All this was predicted, Psalm 22. All this was prophesied, Psalm 22. The Lord gave a foreknowledge of what will happen when Christ will come the first time. Look at this, Psalm 22 verse 1. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? You remember those words, those were the words he spoke on the cross. And so it was prophesied, it was predicted, he was going to die on the cross. And he was going to hang on the cross. Even the words he will speak on the cross, that's the words we have here. When he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why, has, why, has, why art thou so far from hearing me and from the words of my roaring? Look at verse 6, in verse 6, but I'm a warm and no man he reproached to men and despised of the people. He was despised of the people and despised by the people. All they that see me lap me to scorn and they shoot out their leaves, they shake their head, their head saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him let him deliver him sin he delighteth in him. This was the words prophesied according to the foreknowledge of the Father concerning his only begotten Son. Look at verse 16. In verse 16 it says, The dogs have compassed me, and the assembly of, of the wicked have enclosed me. And then he goes on to say, They pierce my hands 
and my feet. That's crucifixion. That did not happen to David who wrote that psalm. It happened to the son of David, the son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He pierced my hand and he pierced my feet. Look at verse 18. Depart my garments among them and cast lost upon my vesture. That did not happen to David. That happened to the Lord Jesus Christ because it had been predicted, prophesied by the foreknowledge of the Almighty God that that suffering will take place. And now it has happened and the benefits of his suffering are yours. The benefits of his suffering are mine. I said the benefits of his suffering are mine. They will be yours in Jesus' name. Isaiah chapter 53, the prophecy and the foreknowledge of his suffering. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 1 was believed our report. To who and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed. It shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He, ha he has no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows. And acquainted with grief, and we did heed as it were our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. It's talking about Christ. This is prophecy concerning Jesus Christ. The same prophet Isaiah that predicted the coming of the forerunner, John the Baptist, also predicted the coming of Christ for the first time. And he says in verse 4, here is what he will come to do. Here is what he will accomplish when he comes. It says, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. And we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But... He was wounded for our transgressions. I say it's right here as if it had happened already. Because once the Father, once the Almighty God declares it, it will happen. It must happen. And so we can put it like in the past tense, like it's happened already. And it says, he was wounded for transgressions. He was bruised for iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with a strife, somebody there tell me, we're healed. It has happened, you will see it. Look at verse 6. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. That's why he came. So that all your sins, all your iniquities, all your transgressions, everything will be laid on Christ. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted. Yet he opened not his mouth. You remember, if you have read about the trial of Jesus when he was betrayed, he asked him all those questions and he answered them not. He opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment. You know, he was taken from the judgment hall, then to Pilate and then to Herod. And then they took him to Carpus, they took him to a pilot all over again. He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. He was crucified, was put to death. And for the transgression of my people was he stricken for your own sin, for my sins, for all our sins. So that he will not give you forgiveness, pardon, peace of heart, and he will give you salvation, redemption. Because he has borne the pain and the punishment of your sin. I don't need to carry that anymore, verse 9. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet... It pleased the Lord to bruise him for our sake. He has put him to grief when 
day when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed and he shall prolong his days. That means, you know, he has died already, he's put to death. And now when he says he will see his days again and prolong his life, that means he'll rise up again and then he will ascend to heaven to live forever and ever. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many because he died and because he shed his blood and because he suffered and he made that sacrifice and offering for sin. Now your life can be justified. For he shall bear the iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil of the strong, because he has put out his soul unto death. And he was numbered with the transgressors, that is, he took a place, he identified with us, he was treated like a transgressor when he was bearing your shame and your sin and your evil. He shall, and he bear the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors. That's a prediction. When Jesus rose from the dead, he assured his own disciples, I told you before, that all that suffering was prophesied, and it was by the foreknowledge of the Almighty God. We're coming to Luke chapter 24. And I read from verse 25. Luke chapter 24. We're reading from verse 25. In verse 25, Then said he unto them, O fools, and slow of heart to believe all that, all that the prophets have spoken. And he says, Ought not Christ to have suffered? Ought not Christ to have suffered? As recorded in prophecy, Ought, ought not Christ to have suffered? As it was predicted, Ought not Christ to have suffered? As it was revealed by the foreknowledge of God, ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Don't you know that the suffering will come before the glory? Don't you know that the sacrifice will come before the manifestation of his sovereignty? And then we're told in verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. From the time of Moses, it had been predicted. And then in all the prophets and in the Psalms, it had been predicted, prophesied by the foreknowledge of God. And he expounded unto them. He explained unto them. He interpreted unto them all the things that were written concerning him. Look at verse 44. In verse 44, and he said unto them, them, these are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding. I pray you'll open your understanding to know that he came forth to suffer, forth to sacrifice. And at the benefits of his suffering, and the benefits of his sacrifice, and the benefits of his death, the benefits of his blood, the benefits of his uh, pass of being the Passover Lamb will come, will accrue to every one of us. When he opens our eyes, we'll not be in the dark again. We'll have understanding of our salvation in him, our sanctification in him, our purity in him. And the provision of every need of our lives in him. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behoved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. He has done it for us already. And I pray the benefits will be ours in Jesus' name. Look at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 26. I'm reading from verse 22. Acts, chapter 26. 
And we're reading from verse 22. In verse 22, having therefore obtained help of God, I continue until this day. Having therefore obtained help of God, this Paul the Apostle talking, he says, I continue until this day. You will continue. I said you will continue. You will receive help of God. Witnessing both to small and great, saying none other things than those which the prophets of Moses did say should come, that Christ should suffer. Moses predicted it. The prophets predicted it. And Paul the Apostle said, that's what I'm saying. That's what I'm preaching. That's what I'm revealing to the people. What Moses and the prophets said, that Christ should suffer and that he should be the force that shall rise from the dead and should show light unto the people and to the Gentiles. All he provided for the years in Jesus' name. It was emphasized uh, concerning the sufferings of Christ that nothing happened by accident. When you come to Christ, you become a new creature in Christ and you become a Christian. Nothing happens by accident in your life. We have emphasized concerning Christ that he wasn't taken by surprise. There will be nothing in your life that will take you by surprise in Jesus' name. And then we have emphasized in Christ that everything that was written concerning him, all those things were fulfilled to the detail, to the minutest detail the Lord knows about you. If you are born again, your name is written in the book of life in heaven. And he has written good, good things concerning you. He has written good, good things concerning me. I said he has written good, good things concerning me. And everything that was written concerning Jesus was fulfilled. Every good thing written concerning me will be fulfilled. Say it for yourself. Every good thing the Lord has written concerning you will be fulfilled in Jesus' name. Let's come back to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And I'm reading now from verse 14. This brings us to the second point. The second point, the powerlessness of the faithless among the saints. The powerlessness of the faithless, of the faithless among the saints. We're looking in at chapter 9 of Mark. And I'm reading from verse 14. From verse 14. And when he came to his disciples... He saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes uh, asking them, uh, asking questions with them, and the scribes questioning him uh, with them, and straightway all the people, when they beheld him, uh, were greatly amazed and running to him, saluted him, and he asked the scribe, "What questions ye? Uh, what question ye was them?" And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son. I have brought unto thee my son. And when he didn't see the Lord, then he introduced the son to the disciples. So the disciples could help, which hath the dumb spirit. And with her, he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnashes with the teeth, and pineth away. And I speak to the disciples, that's when he did see the Lord, that they shall cast him out, but, and they could not. And they could not. Stop there for a moment. Whenever some people pray, an immediate answer has not come, they give up. They say, maybe it's not God's will. Maybe the age of miracles has passed. Maybe God is not healing today. Maybe I'm a special case and I will not be healed. They give the excuses and they stop praying. You will not stop praying. You will not stop asking. You will not stop demanding. Even though he had brought uh, that son to the disciples and the disciples could not do it. He didn't say it's not God's will. Maybe you prayed for something before and it has not been done. Don't say it is not God's will tonight. It is God's will. 
every day you have been weak all your life and you pay for strength that this will change and that will change and nothing has changed and then you say maybe it's not God's will tonight it is God's will yeah. always it is God's will unbelief does not change God's will the faithlessness of disciples will not change God's will and the faithlessness of anyone of any saint of anyone that is praying their faithlessness will not change God's will God's will will be perfected in your life then we're told in verse 19 and he answered him and said oh faithless generation how long shall i be with you how long shall i suffer you how long shall i allow you to remain in this condition bring him unto me he's saying even if you have prayed before and there was no answer you can come again to jesus tonight answer will come miracle will come the moving of your mountain will come that evil power will be neutralized in your life in your wife in your husband in your child in your family in jesus name look at verse 20 and they brought him unto him and he, when he saw him straightway the spirit cheer him you know, the devil may do his worst while you are praying, but keep on praying. That's his last time there. Yeah. And he fell on the ground and wallowed for me. And he asked his father, how long is he to go since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. Whatever problem you've carried from childhood tonight, it is solved in Jesus' name. Yeah. It may be hereditary. It may be from the family background. It may be from the village. It may be before you were married and now it is still continuing. He said, of a child, when you come face to face with Jesus tonight, solution will come. Yeah. Verse 22, and of times, it has cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. That thing will not destroy your life. That thing will not destroy my life. See, this thing will not destroy my life. The Lord has come to rescue you. He has come to restore you. He has come to empower you. He has come to set you free. Nothing from Satan will destroy you. Nothing from evil spirit will destroy you. Nothing from a sinful society will destroy you. Nothing on earth, nothing from hell, nothing from the sea, nothing from bush devils will destroy you in Jesus' name. If you believe that, it is confirmed. Verse 22, and of times it has cast him into the fire and into the waters, to destroy him but if thou canst do anything have compassion on us and help us if thou canst do anything have compassion on us and help us why did he talk like that because already had brought to some disciples and the disciples were not able to help and was saying i don't know as your disciples were not able to help and it came to the limit of their power and to the limit of their knowledge and to the limit of their possibility. I don't know whether about you too, whether that is the same. And we're talking about to this point number two, the powerlessness of the faithless. Look at verse 28. In verse 28, and when he was come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? We tried, we shouted, we prayed, we ran around him, we laid hands on him, we pulled him, we did everything we knew how to do. Nothing happened. Why could we not cast him out? We need to answer that question. Whenever a believer prays 
and the answer is not given. The question is, why is the prayer not answered? For the disciples, number one, forgetfulness. Forgetfulness. Earlier, Jesus Christ had given them all power to cast out devils and to heal all manner of disease. They forgot what he had given them and they were now operating in the natural. And many believers act like that. They forget what they have in the name of Jesus, in the, prophet of, in the promise of Jesus, in the spirit of Christ. They forget the power they have got already. And now they set all that aside and they walk in the natural. They pray in the natural. They think in the natural. Because of that forgetfulness, that's why they could not not heal the boy. Number two, because of fearfulness. Fearfulness. Some people, if they see a demon possessed child, a demon possessed man or woman manifesting and shouting and rolling and foaming, fear will come into them. And if that uh, demon possessed person look them straight in the face as if he's going to pass the evil spirit onto them, then they begin to tremble because of fearfulness. But you will not be afraid of the devil. Because the God of peace shall bruise Satan. Where? Under your feet shortly. He's defeated already. I will stand on him. I will trample on him. I will march on him. And you remain victorious in your life in Jesus' name. Number one, because of forgetfulness. Always remember what you have. And if you remember what you have, you'll be on the victory side. Number two, because of fearfulness. Number three, because of feeding without exercise. Feeding without exercise. You see, there are people, they eat and eat and eat. They never get up to do anything. They're not active. They don't do anything practical. They come on Monday, they feed, they go back home, they do not act on the word. They come on Sunday, they hear the word, they feed from the bread of life, they go back home, there is no exercise. They become fat and feeble, fat and feeble. Because they do not exercise. These disciples had been hearing all the words of Jesus after they went out, Matthew chapter 10, and then they came back and they manifested power. Then they put the power on the shelf. Everything they were hearing now, no exercise. Because of that, that's why many people are not able to do what they ought to do. But when you hear the word of God, you will act on the word of God. You will exercise. You will stand up and what the word says to go and do. You go and do and you are going to succeed in Jesus name. Number one, forgetfulness. Number two, the fearfulness. Number three is the uh, feeling without exercise. Number four, for some people, although we cannot say that for those disciples, the famine of the world. The famine of the world. It's like they're in a famine. And the world is rich and the world is great and the world is good. But they go to the world, it's like there's nothing in that world. They read all the verses. They cannot get anything there. They are in a famine of the world. But you will not be in the famine of the world. Number four, not number, number five, is familiarity with the world. Familiarity. Familiarity brings content. When you are familiar with the source of power. You're familiar with the personality of power. You're familiar with Christ too much. And you can lean on him. You can rub shoulders with him. You can be in the same boat with him. And he can be sleeping. And you know what has coming in. And then you can go to him. Lord, Lord, why are you sleeping? Are you not caring that we perish? Familiarity. Sometimes familiarity will make you forget that it's a two-edged sword. And it can do wonders in your life. You'll not be familiar to the point you are powerless in Jesus name 
number six or whatever the number is fretfulness fretfulness the people they worry too much they worry too much. the wind is blowing they worry a cockroach is passing they worry a demon possessed child is manifesting they worry and the father is pleading and praying and crying they worry everything makes them worry but why worry when you know a christ is going to solve your problem why worry when you know Christ is on the throne? Tonight, Christ is on the throne. He can do everything. He will do everything. You relax because you know your answer has come. You relax because you know your solution has come. At the mention of the name of Jesus, every evil power will flee away in Jesus' name. And so you are not fretful. You are not worried about anything. Other people, not disciples now, but other people, is because of fault finding. Fault finding. The scribes all the time they followed Jesus. They didn't see the power. They didn't taste the power. They didn't possess the power. And the power did not work on them. You know why? Everything Jesus did, they criticized. Why are your disciples eating like that? Why is it they eat with unwashing hands? Why is it they are not following the tradition of the elders? Why is it they are not obeying the elders who are there and they appear independent and they appear indifferent to what the elders have said? Fault finding makes some people to miss the miracle. You'll not be like that. Whatever Christ does is good. I say whatever Christ does is good. And unbelief will not come in in our lives in Jesus' name. If there is unbelief, what happens? Unbelief denies people of genuine salvation. They do not see him as savior. They do not bend to him as savior. They did not, they did not confess to him as savior. The savior was so near. Many of those people, but their unbelief denied them of salvation. Number two, unbelief denies people of healing. His power is always present to heal. But unbelief will deny them of that healing. Unbelief denies people of deliverance. He is able to deliver. Even tonight, he will deliver everyone. Yeah. Unbelief denies people of Christian experiences. Salvation, sanctification, baptism in the Holy Ghost. Unbelief denies people of holiness. They say, I don't understand why I can't be holy. I'm always getting to the same rot, getting to the same mess, and getting to the same defilement every time. I don't understand. I cannot overcome this and that and that. You know why? It's because of unbelief. Because Jesus is able to save to the uttermost. Tonight, unbelief will depart. And faith will come in. And the faith will accomplish everything the Lord has outlined for you in Jesus' name. Amen. Unbelief denies people of answers to prayer. You know, there are people who pray. They pray, they pray a lot. They pray a lot. And, what, and the minute, the minute they're asking the Lord, they're knocking the door every time. Sometimes they lie down, sometimes they kneel down, sometimes they stand up, sometimes they march like a soldier while they are praying. Sometimes they look to heaven and sometimes they beat the air and they're very serious about it. And they pray and pray and pray. But why is it their prayers are not answered? Because of unbelief. Because of unbelief, unbelief denies us of answers to prayer. Unbelief denies us of victory. Unbelief denies us of power. Unbelief denies us of joy. Look at a believer. It's a serious believer. It's a Bible reading believer. It's a Bible studying believer. It's a prayerful believer. It's a conscientious believer. The only thing is that he doesn't have joy. And the joy of the Lord is our strength. Personal. The joy of the Lord 
is my strength. And you know, they are never happy. And if you ask them about the quotation of the Bible, they bring it out immediately. If you ask them about anything, they are able to give you the proper answer. And they read, and they read, and they read, and they pray, but no joy. Why? No faith. Because it's believing the Lord that brings that joy. You'll be filled with the joy of the Lord. And some don't have satisfaction. No faith, because some belief denies us of satisfaction of every good thing. And it can deny us of fellowship with God. And unbelief can deny people of heaven. It will not happen to you. Unbelief will go away. I said unbelief will go away. Look at James chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 6. James chapter 1. We're looking at verse 6. In James chapter 1 verse 6. But let him ask in faith. Whatever you're asking. Love. Wisdom. Power. Authority. Let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and toss. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. But somebody there today is going to receive. Look at Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3, reading from verse 12. Take heed, brethren. He's talking to believers. Take heed, brethren. Lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Unbelief brings instability. Today is in, tomorrow is out. Unbelief brings a person to an unstable situation. That's why it says, Take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. Look at verse, 20, verse 19. So we see that they could not enter in. Because of what? Because of unbelief. Look at Hebrews chapter 4 verse 1. Let us therefore fear lest a promise being left us of entering in any of you shall seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not be mixed with faith in them that had it. The word preached did not benefit them, profit them, did not add anything positive unto them. Why? Because he didn't mix with faith in them that heard it. You come to the Bible study and you hear. For you to profit from what you are hearing, it must mix with faith. That's mine. That's for me. That's going to be done for me. I'm going to be a beneficiary today. And even some people who preach the word, they say the right thing, they preach the right thing, but... They still have the same problems of the old years, the same problem of the old time. And they can preach and they have the word. Why? Because even though they are preaching, it does, they don't personalize what they preach and what they read. It doesn't mix with faith in them that, has, that uh, preach them. Look at verse 6. Seeing therefore, it remained that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of somebody tell me unbelief. Because of unbelief, you will not have unbelief. Unbelief will not remain in your heart. Tonight, you manifest faith. And you are going to receive in Jesus' name. Look at what faith can do. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 16. Above all, taking the shield of faith, 
where we live, ye shall be able to quench. How many that's of the wicked one? Tell me, tell me. Tell yourself. Say it aloud. Let the devil hear. Let the devil know that we know. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith he shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Tonight it will happen. Any dart, any arrow, any affliction will break it tonight. Will destroy it tonight. All the arrows of the devil for everyone broken in Jesus' name. We're coming back to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And we're reading from verse 23. Mark chapter 9. Reading from verse 23. Remember the father of the, ma of the boy possessed with evil spirit had said, If thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. I mean, maybe that's what you're saying. You're saying, I have this problem. It's hereditary. I have this problem. It's been from a child. I have this problem. It's been a long time. I've taken it to so many people and so many places. And it has not been resolved. And now you are saying tonight, if anything can happen, that if it's not on God's side, the if is on your side. Look at verse 23. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, tell me, all things are possible to him that believeth. All things are possible to him that believeth. Let's look at a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 17. Verse 20. Matthew chapter 17. Verse 20. And Jesus said unto them, Because of your own belief, For verily I say unto you, If ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, Ye shall say, To what? Ye shall say unto what? Unto this mountain, remove hands to yonder place, and it shall remove. Yeah. Your mountain, and it shall remove. Yeah. Mountain in your family, and it shall remove. Yeah. Impediment to your spiritual life, and it shall remove. Yeah. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Nothing shall be impossible unto you. Make it personal. The Lord confirm it in your life in Jesus' name. Mark chapter 11. In Mark chapter 11, what do you mean from verse 22? Mark 11, verse 22. And Jesus answering saith unto he unto them have faith in God. If you could not have faith, Jesus would not have commanded have faith in God. You can have faith in God, you have faith in God. Yeah. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say, that whosoever, whosoever, who is the whosoever? I said, who is the whosoever? There is no discrimination in heaven. There is no partiality in heaven. And tonight you, whosoever, shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he say shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. I will have whatsoever I say. Therefore I say unto you that what things soever ye desire when ye pray, believe that ye receive them, and ye shall have them. And I will have them. And you will have them. 
and miracles will be confirmed in your life. Yes. Romans chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 4. We're reading from verse 17. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him whom he believed, even God, who quickness the dead and calleth those things which be not as though they were. That's how to have the miracle. And calleth those things as though they were. And calleth those things which were not as though they were. You will not say, I don't have because I cannot see. I don't have because I cannot feel. I don't have because I do not know that my prayer is ever answered. But I know I have. I said I know I have. I said I know I have. You may not see it in the physical, but you will confess it before its creation. Calling those things would be not as though they were. Who against hope believed in hope? There's no hopeless situation in your life. Yeah. Don't kill yourself. Don't crucify yourself. Don't destroy yourself. And don't negate your own goodness saying, my case is hopeless. My case is unthinkable. My case is not hopeless. Your case is not hopeless. Your wife is not hopeless. Your husband is not hopeless. Your children, not hopeless. Yeah. We against hope, believed in hope. That he might become the father of many nations. According to that which is spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not in somebody now dead. You don't consider how you feel. You don't consider what you see. We don't consider I touch that place and the place is dead. There's no feeling there. And being not weak in faith, they considered not is somebody now dead. When he was about a hundred years old. A hundred years old. I'm going to ask you a question. Don't, don't say it out. Don't shout it. You just know it in your heart. How old are you? Don't talk, but you remember? How old you are? This one was a hundred years old. Anybody up to 100 there? What God has promised, whatever your age, I'm in my 70s, I'm in my 80s, I'm in the 50s, and I've been asking this one was in the 40s, forget about the past, today is a new day. Yeah. He considered not his body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through belief, but was strong in faith. That's me tonight. He was strong in faith. That's you tonight. God cannot lie. God cannot fail. Whatever he said he will do, he will do. Therefore, you are strong in faith, giving glory to God and being fully persuaded. How persuaded are you? Fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. Fully persuaded that what he has promised, he was able also to perform. There's a performance in your life tonight. And it is all by faith. All things by faith. Our salvation by faith. Our sanctification by faith. Our acceptance and assurance. The assurance we have that everything will be alright by faith. Your purity and your power will purify your heart. It will empower you. It will baptize you and fill you with the Holy Ghost. It's all by faith. Our confidence and our courage. Our boldness and our authority. All by faith. Our healing. Our health. By what? By faith. Signs and wonders upon your life. By what? Supernatural grace. My grace is sufficient for you. Whatever you are going through. 
that Paul the apostle, he went to the Lord three times and the Lord answered and said, you know what you need? You need grace and my grace is sufficient for you. Tonight, you have sufficient grace and spiritual gifts. In fact, tonight, all things at all times, for all places, in every situation, all things are possible unto you. And it's all by faith. I said it's all by faith. Mark chapter 9. I'm reading from verse 23. Mark chapter 9, verse 23. Jesus answered, Jesus said unto him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said, With tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Think about that. He had belief. He said, yes, I believe. But underneath, there is something like unbelief. Help thou mine unbelief. What's that telling us? If there is belief, faith on the surface, and even some doubt and unbelief on the ground, God will answer your prayer. Yeah. If with your heart, there is faith. With my heart, Lord, I believe. But in my mind, and there's something that is pinching me somewhere, and uh, that's giving me so, um, some unbelief, he will answer your prayer. Lord, I believe, help thou my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, saying unto him, now you need to understand. Whatever the man felt and whatever the man said, once Jesus opens his mouth and he speaks to that dumb spirit, the work is done. I said the work is done. Whatever you feel, however you feel, once Jesus opens his mouth and he speaks to the origin of your problem, the source of your problem, and the one that is causing your problem, once he speaks unto that person, unto that spirit, the work is done. Your feeling will not change the efficacy of the words of Jesus. And it's only for him to speak. He said, not unto the man now, but he said unto the dumb spirit, thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. Come out now. And after you have come out, don't come back. There will be permanent deliverance dominion here tonight. And the spirit cried and rent him so and came out of him and came out of him and came out of him. And he was like as he was dead. In as much as many said he is dead. But no, you will not die. Amen. And Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. Amen. Lifted him up and he arose. Lifted him up and he arose. He lifts you up today. You are arise in strength. Arise in power. Arise in authority. Arise with the answer. Arise with dominion. Arise with healing. And Jesus took him up by the hand, lifted him up. And he arose. Remember, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Since I have believed tonight, all things, say it for yourself, all things are possible for me because I believe. Possible. Where are you? Possible. 
in your family, possible. Your tears are dried up, possible. Your yoke is broken, possible. Your sickness gone, possible. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. I believe. What are you? I believe. Rise up and tell him, I believe. Rise up and shout it, I believe. Rise up and reaffirm, I believe. All things are possible. Open your mouth and tell the Lord, I believe. I'm not a doubter. I believe I'm not an unbeliever. I believe I'm not hopeless. I believe I'm not powerless. I believe I receive. I believe it is mine. I believe long-standing problems are removed. I believe age-long mountains are removed. I believe the power of sin is broken. I believe the afflictions are gone. I believe I overcome. I believe and it is done. I believe I'm more than a conqueror. The weakness cannot remain. The powerlessness cannot remain. The impotence cannot remain. The bad luck cannot remain. The sinfulness cannot remain. You need salvation? Jesus is your Savior. Tell him. Tell him, salvation is for every sinner. No, say maybe, maybe, maybe. There's no, there's not a maybe. He forgives everyone that calls upon his name. Come unto the Lord. Confess and forsake your sin. And then believe. He suffered for you. He came the first time to suffer. To reverse the fall of man. He came the first time. To bear our sin upon himself. He came the first time to die, to shed his blood. To remove the guilt of sin. To remove every condemnation of sin. And whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. You are that whosoever. Believe. Take that salvation. Believe. Receive that salvation. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. And as you are saved, believe that He gives you power already. 
power to live free from sin. Power to be victorious over sin. Power to live in righteousness. Power to live for His glory. And to live in His glory. He has come to set you free. He has come to set you free. What fears? You can have assurance. What fears? You have acceptance by the Father. What faith? You have forgiveness. I have. I have. What faith? You have freedom. If the Son shall make you free. Ye shall be free indeed. One hundred percent free. Totally free. Your soul, your spirit, your emotion, your thoughts, all that bound you, you are released from them. Sanctification is yours. Only believe. His blood can cleanse you from every sin. His blood can destroy the very body of sin. The origin of sin. The propensity to sin. The very nature of sin, the blood of Jesus will wipe everything away. Believe in and you are sanctified. Believe in and you are made holy. Believe in. Are you strengthened in the inner man? Believe. If thou canst believe, all things are possible. You have joy. You have power. You have satisfaction. You can have your Christian experiences right here and now. Healing. Deliverance. Dominion. Fellowship with God. Unbroken relationship with God. Sufficient grace to go through a life. No more defeat. No more falling. No more weakness. No more discouragement. No more lack. All things are yours. All things are possible. That mountain will move. 
that impossibility will be possible. By faith, all that I need, by faith, all I ask, by faith, All joy, all happiness, all satisfaction by faith. Only believe, and it's done. Only believe. And it's done. All things at all times. All things in all situations. Remember the faith of Abraham? not looking at his body and not looking at the deadness of Sarah's womb not looking at the physical not looking at the evidence Or be not weak in faith, strong in faith, was giving glory to God and calling those things which be not as though they were. Calling those things which be not as though they were. Call it into existence in your life. Call it into the present in your life. It cannot fail and faith cannot fail. Standing on the promises you cannot fail. Believing the promises you cannot fail. Holding on without giving up you cannot fail. He answers prayer. He answers prayer. Lord, I believe. Lord, I believe. Help thou my own belief. And Jesus spoke to that deaf and dumb spirit. And the feeling of the Father could not hinder the power of the words of Jesus. You're speaking to your problem now. You're speaking to that challenge in your life now.
come out and enter no more. Receive the blessing and remain in the blessing. If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Since thou hast believed, all things are possible to him that believeth. I believe. And as you go back home, keep on believing. Keep on believing. However you feel, keep on believing. Whatever you see, keep on believing. Whatever you hear, keep on believing. He is a believer. Keep on believing. To him, to her, all things are possible. In Jesus' name we pray. God has answered my prayer. Say it for yourself. God has answered my prayer. Whatever I see, I'll keep on believing. Whatever I feel, I'll keep on believing. Whatever I hear, I'll keep on believing. Whatever people say, I keep on believing. I have spoken to my mountain. My mountain has left, and whatever may be the appearance, I count the mountain gone. I count my mountain gone. I count my problem solved. I count my body healed. I count my soul saved. I have received my answer. Where are you? Raise up that hand. You are going to receive something. And what you receive is going to be permanent. Somebody help me shout permanent. Father in Jesus name. We bless your name for the revelation of your word. That Christ came the first time to suffer. And in the suffering and sacrifice, he has taken all our sins away. Confirm each and every life in Jesus' name. The burden of sin, the load of sin, the condemnation of sin, the guilt of sin, the power of sin, the pain of sin, the punishment of sin. Take away from everybody in Jesus' name. And as everyone believes now that you save them, let that salvation be real and genuine and definite in Jesus' name. All other, other Christian experiences give unto your people. Lord, you are weak at the weeping post and by your stripes were healed. Nobody has right to bear that sickness anymore when you have taken everything away. And so for every brother, every sister, every man, every woman, everyone at the study with us tonight, I pray, Lord, every form of sickness out from your body in Jesus' name. Satan has no power to oppress any believer anymore. 
because the prophecy is that he will bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. And the seed of the woman, Christ, will bruise his head. Satan is bruised for everyone. Every demonic power, every affliction of evil spirit, every bad luck, every yoke, every curse, come under your feet now in Jesus' name. You are healed in Jesus' name. You are delivered in Jesus' name. As you go back home, power goes with you. Peace goes with you. Purity goes with you. Provision goes with you. Prosperity goes with you. Impossibilities are now possible in your life. The name of Jesus has brought untold blessings upon you tonight. And your blessings from salvation to Christian experiences to healing to deliverance to dominion to mountain moving will be permanent in your life in Jesus' name. Confirm your mighty hand in every life. Let there be joy. Let there be happiness. Let there be satisfaction. Let there be permanence in every one of the miracle you have given in Jesus' name. Joy of the Lord to be multiplied in every life. We know it is done. I know it's done for me. I know it's done for me. I know it's done for me. Thank you, Lord. Confirm it in everyone. In Jesus' name we pray.